Tanvir is going to be covering with us um, his framework, what he's using to prospect and be successful, including seven effective prospecting habits for your cold outreach success. Are you ready to dive in? How are we feeling? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's jump right in. So the biggest, arguably the biggest change I made to the way that I prospected was this, the preparation stage. So before, again, it was, I would show up to my day, be like, okay, I need to make 50 calls today. Who am I going to call? All right, let me pull up all the tabs. Okay, well, but what am I going to say? Let me do some research. And what this resulted in was in a one hour, 90 minute prospecting block where I should be making 50 calls. Instead, I'm spending half the time just trying to do research, figure out who I'm going to call and how I'm going to contact them. What I then did was instead take an hour every Monday, an hour to, to 90 minutes to figure out who exactly am I going to contact this week? When am I going to contact them? So what prospecting block can I block it off in my calendar? Where will I be contacting them? Am I going to email them? Am I going to cold call them? Am I going to use LinkedIn? Am I going to do a combination of, the, of those few? And then what exactly will I say? You want to have something to cut through the noise. Your prospects inboxes are flooded. If you don't have something that stands out, it's it's just going to get lost in the sea of, of messaging that they get. Mm -hmm. So there's five ways that you can prospect. The best is to prospect to the individual. So were they on a podcast? Is there an interview that they did? Is there something that I can grab from their LinkedIn? Something that I can use that will really hook them in and be like, wow, this person did their research on me and knows exactly who I am in their messaging. If you can't find anything, in some cases you can't, right? People work in industries where, again, there's not that much public information. Can you personalize to the persona? So what exactly does a VP of sales in that industry, in that region, what sort of challenges do they potentially face, right? What does their day-to-day -day look like? And then even more, if you, for whatever reason, you can't use persona personalization, you can get personalization based on the company they're at. So any website updates, any social media updates, any new press releases, uh, you can personalized based on the competition. This one's not as, as much used, but it's like if they have a big name competition within their space, calling that out might not be a bad idea. And then industry. So what are some of the common trends, uh, you know, pains, challenges, problems that they face in their industry as well? You have to have something that hits home, right? So I would try, again, going back to a little bit of the personalization, if they've called out a specific pain or problem in their annual report, on their website, um, somewhere where I can get an idea of, okay, what pain might this person be going through and attach sometimes a KPI to it, right? So retention rate or leads falling through the cracks was one that I commonly used, right? Or um, monthly recurring revenue, like things that I can, that are, that are tangible and top of mind for that executive that I can present in the form of a problem. And then there's different kinds of pain. And these you wouldn't look, use all at once. You would use them in follow-ups, so what's a long-term pain this person might be going through, short-term pain, internal pain, external pain. You want to give them something compelling where they're like, oh yeah, that's, you want the, you want the person reading the email to be like, yep, that sounds about right. Like this is something that we're facing. It's great that you can identify a problem, but you got to have something to say. If you want to be positioned, not as just a salesperson, but also a trusted advisor, you got to be willing to sort of interrupt their thought patterns, their existing thought patterns and present something that's thought provoking. So a lot of the time I'll ask questions like, hey, what if you could do this? You know, um, have you thought about X? Have you thought about Y? Um, the other piece is, okay, again, can I, can I use specific insights to demonstrate that I'm an expert in this space with tangible insights, something from a report, from data that I can use? Um, interrupting their thought processes, hey, maybe they've said something again in an interview or something like that, that I could you know, challenge them to think about it differently or think about something new. Um, and challenge the status quo, I think, is, is a little bit self, self explanatory, but you want to give them a reason to decide that, okay, what we're doing is not maybe the best way that we could be doing this. You can say everything that you want, you can have all this expertise, but unless you have evidence of your success or of your work, it's hard to actually get that meeting. If I'm reaching out to Salesforce leaders, I might say something like, we've had 100 plus Salesforce account executives enroll in our program as, an, as, a, as proof. Right. So something that shows that, okay, we've done this before. We're not newbies at this. Sometimes like a lot of the examples that you'll see here, I'll just refer to the fact that I've worked with similar companies in the first email. And I'll, then I'll provide more context in follow-up emails or LinkedIn messages. PS is just something I, I find has worked tremendously in terms of adding another layer of personalization. A lot mm -hmm. of people will skip to the end when they're reading an email 
So when they see the personal touch also included at the end, it just gives them to be what gives them a little wow. Okay, this person's really put some effort into this. I just keep it short and sweet. Um, studies do show, and marketing studies do show that PSs tend to increase response rate. If I have a tier one account or tier A account, and I know that our solution can help this customer because we've worked with similar customers, I will keep them in my follow up cadence, so to speak until I get a yes or a no. If you're politely persistent, as long as you're not pushy, if you have good points, if you're providing value, if you're you know, referencing proof, if you're referencing um, you know, testimonials and you're consistent enough, a lot of the time you will, you will get a response. Most of the time it'll be a no, but that's okay. I'd rather have a no than a maybe. That's how I look at it.